Code Zero, Code D, Jib, Genoa, Jenica, Spinnaker, Screecher, Parasailer. To a non-sailor like me, it's all jargon. I'll ask 10 people and get 10 different answers. Well, in this week's episode, we hope to give you the definitive answer. City028 on Patreon wants to know, what are the differences between light wind sails? And if you don't have one, which is the best all-round sail to choose? Good question. Well, in this week's episode, you will see that we get quite a bit of mileage out of our own cruising code zero. And we also hope to demystify the complicated and scary subject of light wind sails. Keep watching because we have a secret link for you. But before all of that, in this week's episode, we are in the very southernmost point, the last island on the west coast of Sumatra. It was one of our favourites. Darianto. Darianto. Yeah. Darianto. So we've just landed the dinghy and Darianto and his and his name is Ina. 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 Darianto and Ina are very helpful bringing the dinghy uh, to shore. Gave us a line to tie on to. And Darianto has just said, use his bike to do well, some shopping. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Tanakasi. <laughs> so kind. I didn't ask. Just said, use my bike. Well, thank you. So we jumped on the bike and uh, two minutes up the road, a little track. By the way, I just have to say, isn't that amazing? Complete random stranger. We just tip up, tie the dinghy up, and he says, here, have my scooter. I mean, where else are you ever going to find that? Anyway, so we've just been two minutes up the road and uh, we've come to the first village and it looks like there's some kind of uh, Muslim wedding going on. So this is Bang Bang, Bang Bang, Bang, Bang. Yes. and he's from Java but Java. his wife is from Engano and he's going to give me a quick tour of this rather splendid hotel. First thing I love are the, um, the bamboo that they've lined down each side, keep it nice and cool. Three floors. Three floors, yeah. So what do you have here? You have uh, papaya? Papaya. Yep. Uh, that looks. California. That looks like. Is that uh, mint or potato? Hold on. Oh, oh no, it's, it's, le uh, it's uh, lemon. Good, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. I think that's lemongrass. Mm. Yeah. Oh. Good for the ah. for the stomach, yeah. Beautiful. What do we have here? Looks like some kind of. A marrow, marrow related, I think. <laughs> like a, I'm not entirely sure what they are. Uh, do you like? Yeah. Do you like? Yes. Nice. So 
I've just been uh, cruising up northwards. Roads are very bumpy, a bit uncomfortable, so we don't want to go too far. We don't really want to take the piss since the guy lent us his uh, scooter. Probably should put some benzene in it, but we just took a little side turning and decided to have a look down this back road here. And look at this. This is when you think of Indonesia and you see the holiday brochures, this is the kind of scene that you expect to see. It does actually exist, it is real. Well, midday, of course, that's why the sun is coming straight down here and it's hot. Although having said that, I've seen some pretty big storm clouds uh, collecting over in the northwest, which wasn't really predicted, but I guess that's uh, par for the course this time of year, I suppose. But uh, anyway, we're just on our way back and we've just stopped off in this rather beautiful sort of toy town-like village. Uh, every single house is different, brightly coloured and uh, and the, each one has a beautifully manicured lawn, like an English garden. And this is the local shop with the resident puppy. Hello puppy! And then uh, this kid here who's got his own pet chick. <laughs> so we just realised it's a Sunday and this is why all the kids are out today. Everyone's off work, apart from this lady who runs her local store. Just thought I'd show you what one of these stores looks like inside if you're interested. Mainly sweets and uh, chocolates. So we're just going to stock up on a few things, not many fresh... Essential uh, things, like uh, Yes, this is, these are for the night watches. <laughs> lots and lots of biscuits and you have to understand of course that it's quite difficult for these guys to get fresh fruit and veg being so cut off lots of drinks and then at the back here we do have some more practical stuff we've got engine oil spray paints and uh and what have you washing powders lots of palm oil of course it's all palm oil here very difficult to find any other kind of oil Okay, just switching to night vision <laughs> and a follow up on the fish that Liz caught a couple of days ago, which we haven't really discussed any further. But on the first day, we had lovely kind of I don't know fish beer based type stew thing but yeah. with no fish in it no nope. but fish tasting the second night we had the stock fish cakes that was last night yeah which was rather splendid and this evening we have the big chunks of fish steak been marinating for tw uh, two days yes I've just had a couple of mouthfuls and it is absolutely delicious. Mm -hmm. uh, in the video it looks like it's burnt but it's not. That's the marinade. Liz, what's in the sauce? Mm. Um. I'll let you finish your mouthful. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. As far as I know it's got ginger, soy sauce, um, God, look at that, and the flesh. I think I think it is a mackerel that we caught. Yeah I think so, some yeah. kind. 
Mm. Uh, so obviously it's got yeah, it's got soy sauce and um, fresh ginger, fresh garlic. There's definitely a taste of sesame in it. Yes, that's on the tomatoes as well. So not quite sure. And I also put didn't have any white wine open, so I used rosé, <laughs> and then half a lemon squeezed in there as well. Mm. It really is marvellous. And mashed potato as I like it. Mm. Lumpy with the skin. <laughs> Delicious. So we leave Engano and what a beautiful place it was. Thoroughly enjoyed our short stay there. It was a shame we couldn't spend any longer. Time's pushing on of course. Uh, there seem to be a few anchorages, especially on the sort of northeast coast, which I think given more time it would have been nice to have gone round there and uh, picked out some of those, but uh, we don't have much time left now so we have to push on. Just had a bit of an issue with the chain getting wrapped around a rock or something in about 12 to 14 metres and uh, managed to get out of it using the same technique as we did last time at Tello when we got stuck, and that is to um, come up to the anchor, so the chain so that it's almost taut and then pivot on it, spin 180 degrees and then back up on it. Can't guarantee it's going to happen every time that happens but uh, at least we're free of it now. So we've got another two day journey and uh, the weather forecast is not great unfortunately but it's nothing to do with wind, it's all about the rain and we've got some really heavy rain forecast in fact, as we leave this bay, we're going straight towards one school I've been watching, which actually has been moving southerly, so hopefully we'll stay behind that. But there's a few more to come, and I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. So we've been motoring most of the day, and very happy to say that we've now turned the engine off. We've got the Kraken out and the mainsail. Uh, we were expecting to have rain, but it seems to be keeping to the north and we've now got the wind pretty much set for as long as it will set uh, which is giving us just enough angle to get the sails out and still go in the right direction so uh, yep just enjoying it while we can Speed's picked up and it's also come around a bit closer to the nose so we're I think it's about 45 degrees apparent so that's pretty tight especially for a light wind sail but as you can see we've managed to uh, pull her right in and with around about nine knots of true wind uh, we're hitting uh, up to five knots of sp uh, speed which is great. Well, the wind started to pick up and it was hitting about 12 knots and so we just thought well maybe put the code zero away it was very close so the front edge was laughing a bit as well but amazing how close you can get and how fast we were going as well but uh, I was getting a little bit paranoid about the shackle that I've used and um, and the block as well I think it's a little bit undersized so I didn't want to tension it in anymore so anyway, we've put that away. We're now back to our classic Esper sail plan, which is main, mizzen, stay sail, and foresail. And very comfortable, thank you very much. At five knots, apparently, according to Liz. Well, 
well as the sun tips below the horizon. Here's a few stats for you and you can see that uh, we've got an apparent wind speed of about 12 knots, true wind of about 9. Uh, true wind is coming from about there so we're pretty close hauled. Uh, the apparent wind is roughly about here and uh, we're going along quite nicely at hitting five knots but we're now dropped to around about 4.6 between four and four and a half i suppose uh, interestingly we have also gone into some rather deep waters so we crossed over the thousand meter mark and here you can see we're hitting 1500 meters and soon we'll be hitting 2000 meters and this is called the engano basin so it's named after the island we've just stayed at pretty deep waters Look at this, everything's gone pink. Pink over there, that's the east. Pink in the west. And uh, just trying to work out what's going on with these clouds. As we said, there is some rain forecast, not really wind, but uh, a bit of rain. Uh, we had some cirrus clouds, uh, wispy clouds in the sky. You can see the remainder of those just up there. And cirrus clouds sometimes mean a front coming through it can mean dirty weather but as it seems at the moment it looks okay i think it's all happening really on land that's sumatra over there and you can see the thicker clouds uh, just above the horizon there a few more wispy cirrus clouds up in the sky there we'll keep an eye on the wind um, it'll be a shame to put some of the sails away of course general practice at night time is to reduce sail but we're making good progress so maybe we'll put a reef in the main and the full sail just to be on the safe side. Right, I'm on the phone, not my normal camera so a little bit wobbly. Uh, in fact this part of the leg is a little bit wobbly. We've got a couple of storms we're trying to pass. This is the uh, forecast that we were talking about earlier. So it's kind of like the, the edge, I suppose, the very edge of these really heavy rain clouds. Uh, we haven't actually had much rain, but we've had a lot of lightning and that's obviously what I'm really bothered about. So I'm just, um, I've, I've altered course to, to avoid one. I've got the radar on, I've just avoided one. I'm now just going past the second one. You see the odd flash of light here and there. It's all around us. Just taking a quick detour here, trying to avoid this. There's quite a bit of lightning going on. So I've just altered course, 20 degrees to starboard. Uh, it started there, so it's moving that way, or rather I'm moving that way. Not very nice. Well, you tried to go to sleep, and uh, then we saw quite a lot of rain and a lot of lightning. On, to, on our starboard side and then the more and more we looked at the radar we could see there was no way we were going to miss it so instead of doing that we just turned directly into it back onto our waypoint and we're now going through it as fast as we well not very fast but we're going through it and it's going over us uh, lightning is still around and a bit freaky but we're okay at the moment we we had some lightning quite close and the wind instrument seems to have stopped working but we're not going to play around with anything until we're nice and settled again and we'll see if we can get it back. Well that broken wind instrument isn't going to help us decide when to put up the code zero Ooh, next no. is it? <laughs> uh, fortunately it was a classic case of turn it off and on again. Always works. Uh, we had a brilliant sail that day under our fabulous Kraken, but to begin with it was a little dodgy, the winds were very, very light. We sheeted her in and perfection. Yes, it was great. We got a good sail and as you saw the winds eventually picked up enough that we had to furl away the Kraken and we had to put the white sails out. We're going to be talking a little bit more about when you should and shouldn't put up your light wind sails. We asked a number of people for their experiences of light wind sails, among them Phil Auger of Zoom Sails, who of course made the Kraken and all of our sails. We also talked to oyster owners from the Oyster Owners website and our patrons as always, and we also put the question on our community tab. Yes, talking to the community tab, uh, by way of introduction I guess we should thank Carson Murray, 
who posted up this graphic. Uh, it comes from the Cruisers Forum and it shows different types of cells where C's is for code zeros, G's is for Genicas, A's for asymmetrics and S's for symmetrics. But before you switch off in horror at the 16 different possible combinations of cells, we're going to simplify it for you. We're going to forget all the sails used in racing and just concentrate on what cruisers use in light winds. And for that, we're going to turn to Phil Auger of Zoom Sails. Now, Phil used to do a lot of racing. He was also a Liverpool cruiser himself. And of course, he's got 20 odd years of sail making behind him. So he of all people understands how important it is to try and simplify this topic. And Phil says that most cruisers will tend to only have one to two downwind sails, and he breaks them up into three broad categories. Number one, symmetrical spinnaker, or a parasailer type sail. Number two, asymmetrical spinnaker, either on a furler or in a sock. And three, a code zero or screecher on a furler. We're going to start with a symmetrical spinnaker. Now this is the classic downwind sail, which runs from a bean reach to running dead downwind. In terms of design, it's symmetrical. That is, the left-hand side of the sail is the same as the right-hand side. The sail shape is more of a half-circle curve than an aerofoil. It uses the spinnaker pole and a series of running rigging and halyards to control the sheets, sail and pole. The advantage of a symmetrical spinnaker is its ability to run dead downwind together with the mainsail, which asymmetrics tacked onto the bow of the boat aren't so efficient at. The disadvantage, however, is its complexity in setting up. While you can fly the spinnaker without a pole, the sail is not all that stable, although on a wide catamaran it is quite okay to fly the spinnaker from the bows without a pole. The parasailer is a spinnaker with a horizontal wing increasing the stability of the sail and offers the cruiser some advantages over the traditional spinnaker, but they are expensive. Hans and Margareth Campers are patrons and they also have an Oyster 49 and they say we sail our oyster, sailing yacht Marika of Holland, basically two-handed. This in reality means single-handed, so our full spinnaker is nicely put away on the attic. And Stephanie Schaefer on Patreon says that she thinks spinnakers are a really great idea and she'd love to use hers more, particularly when she's going into the marina, but she's worried about it. And she says it keeps her from trying it. Um, I've considered getting a sock, which would lessen my fear. Kenny Stevens of Cactus Sailing YouTube channel emailed us with a whole load of clips and videos which are worth checking out. And he says, we use a spinnaker, it's our only downwind sail unless it's blowing over 15 knots, then it gets a little hairy to get rid of. Keeping it in a sock means no corkscrews and keeping it simple means we use it a lot. And that's the key with downwind sails in my opinion. Unless you're on a long passage, it almost seems pointless setting it up, which is why I love our cruising chute. This brings us neatly on to our next category, which is the asymmetrical spinnaker. And this category has a lot of different types of sails, but the most popular for cruisers is the cruising chute. In terms of design, it's not symmetrical and is generally used for reaching. Its performance drops off when running downwind. Biggest advantages are that you can tack it onto the bow of the boat and fly it without a pole, making it easier to handle jibing than a symmetrical spinnaker. They can also be used together with a top-down furling unit, which generally is easier than a sock for deploying and retrieving the sail. The most feedback and examples we received on this whole subject of lightwind sails was the asymmetrical cruising chute. Uh, David Coolkill, he owns an oyster called Serendipity. She's a 575 and he says, uh, we have an asymmetric cruising chute. As do most, it flies best at 120 degrees apparent. We can carry it at 100, but no closer except in very light airs. The tack line is adjustable under load, led back to the secondary winch so I can raise and lower the tack. If we give it air, i.e. raise the tack, when approaching dead downwind, it will cant to windward and avoids being blanketed by the main. Paul Smyers has an asymmetrical spinnaker which launches from a sock from their 43-foot catamaran. In this photo it was blowing about 4-6 to six knots and we were making 2-4 to four knots speed over ground. Paul was a racer and can confirm how much easier an asymmetric is compared to a symmetric, especially when racing. Well, to be honest, asymmetrics can still be a little bit troublesome for your average cruiser. I mean, I remember those days in Turkey, those almost windless, baking hot days, running around our teak deck, trying to raise our, our cruising chute, and 
invariably ends up cursing and swearing. It's a sentiment that's shared uh, with Boyd Goldie aboard Zebedee, and uh, he says his wife Debbie calls it the divorce <laughs> shoot. Yeah. And Floss, who owns a f another 435, funny Yay. enough, uh, called Fat Sue, she got in touch. It's made me laugh, and she said, just getting the bloody thing out of the garage, aka the lazarette, is generally more effort than we can be bothered with. Yeah, we sympathise there very much, and I do agree to a certain extent, a lot of the time you really can't be bothered because the wind you know is going to change pretty quickly. Maybe you should do what we've done, and what Hans and Margaret have also done, get yourself a code zero. And that brings us nicely on to Phil Auger's third category of sale. The Code Zero is a cross between a Genoa and an asymmetric spinnaker and it's really used for sailing a little bit closer to the wind than the other sails we've mentioned, specifically in light airs. It has a much flatter triangular shape compared to a spinnaker. Code Zeros have become extremely popular among cruisers because they are durable, forgiving and simple to deploy. In one of our earlier episodes we showed how Jamie and Jai, our rigger, set up the Kraken, our Code Zero, on Esper. You can see quite clearly how easy the sail is to deploy and put away thanks to the furler mounted on the bow and the infinity furling line. Laurie Bryce is skipper of Oyster 745 Satori and he says, I no longer fly asymmetrical as I launched the boss off the deck with it one time. Seeing the guy who pays the bills 15 foot in the air is a bit exciting. <laughs> He's settled on the Code Zero and says, we fly our Code Zero in all sorts. Even Code Zeros come in different flavours. You can have some design for overlapping Genoa boats and non-overlapping Genoa boats. But between the different designs, you can expect to sail anything between 45 degrees, what, which is what you saw us doing in that last video clip, up to about 140 degrees. To summarise then, a symmetrical spinnaker is normally used for downwind sailing and has to be pulled out on a monohull. Phil Auger of Zoom Sail says, symmetrical with pole can sail 180 downwind can beam reach at 90 with pole forward and in light air can sail with apparent wind forward of the beam. But it's a lot of work to set up and trim with the pole. An asymmetric is more for reaching and doesn't need a pole. Phil says asymmetricals can go from the hindquarter to the beam to forward of the beam in light airs. Without the mainsail it can also run at 180 degrees but with the mainsail it will collapse in the mainsail's wind shadow at 180. On catamarans, it is sometimes tacked to the windward bow, allowing deep running just like a symmetrical. The Code Zero is a large Genoa that covers your wind angles from about 45 degrees to 140. Phil says the Code Zero or the Screecher can do the beam, forward of the beam and to hindquarter, and once again it will collapse behind the main at 180 degrees. But it can also be pulled out wing and wing opposite side to the main for 180 degrees running. And don't forget, a screecher is generally used for multi-hulls. It's similar to a Code Zero. It's cut a little bit heavier and it's a bit more like a Genoa. And there's one other sail that we haven't mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that is actually one of our favourites. And that's the mizzen stay sail. Obviously, yes. this is only of any use if you have a catch rig. But it's a really easy sail to, to hoist up. Uh, the tack is taken to the centre of the boat in front of the mast. And it's super light and very easy to manage. And where possible, we will use that. I believe in America it's called a mizzen ballooner. There we go. Don't forget we have a secret link for you, so keep watching. So there is something we haven't talked about yet, and that's speed. Dan on Patreon said, what's the max speed that we would fly the Kraken in? Well, we asked Phil and he said there are no rules really, it's about whatever you're comfortable with. Yeah, and he also mentioned that sails don't necessarily blow out because of too much wind. They're more likely to blow out if they're flogging or if maybe they're old. Laurie Bryce chips in on this one and he tells us that he's had his Code Zero up in 27 knots. And he was in a true wind angle of 150 to 160 and they were doing 15.7 knots. <laughs> well, I guess that's what happens when you skipper a 75 foot oyster. OK, let's just end up with a final word from our patrons Paul and Cheryl of Sailing Vessel Hawkeye and they say I love sailing with my spinnaker I set the wind alarm to 15 knots true and grab a book I look up every time I turn a page and check for other boats and get back into reading best sailing always gets done under light winds 
just before we go, secret link. Yeah, we've got a secret link. It's in the description. And Phil Auger of Zoom Sales has very kindly written a blog post to accompany this video all about light wind sales. So he's going to break down in a little bit more detail those three main categories of light wind sales. And uh, yeah, check out the link below in the description. Thank you, Phil. And thank you, everyone, for watching.